hear me? Good. Uh, so while the previous talk, uh, the things I will talk about is pretty much the, the same. In, in, in essence, we are touching on each other uh, in terms of birth and so on. But this talk is more about research. So I'm from a, a company called RISE, which is Research Institutes of Sweden. Um, the part I'm from is it was usually called Six Swedish Institute of Computer Science uh, a few years ago. And now we have big pains reorganizing, and we're, I think, 2,700 people uh, from all over Sweden, every technical research institute. And this is one of the research uh, pro projects I'm involved in right now. Um, this is, uh, the title is Text Categorization as Event Annotation. Uh, it's a uh, work with Uppsala Conflict Data Program. So it could as well have been, uh, been um, called from hypothesis to experiment, but that's that's sexy perhaps. Uh, <laughs> because it turns out that everything we do uh, always, you know, are hindered by, by the data and data mangling and getting data and getting prepar prepared and so on. I see several heads nodding. Uh, I'm not alone. That's nice. Uh, and also, since this is more of a workshop event, I encourage you to to ask questions whenever they pop up feel free to interrupt. So, uh, okay, no. Like so. Uh, I'll run through a few slides and after that you'll pretty much know the gist of it and then you can relax, you know, zone out. I'll see you, but you can zone out. Um, so we carried out comparative experiments concerning 17 different text categorization tasks for a single data set. Um, using state-of-the-art representation methods, ELMO, BERT, and ULM FIT. And why did we do this? Uh, we have a project together with the Department of Peace and Conflict Research in Uppsala. They have uh, probably one of the coolest data set I've seen. They have almost 40 years worth of data on conflicts. It's a very sad data set as well, because every data point is people dying. Um, and one of their challenges or problems, and I, a problem is, is a very positive thing in, in my world, because if you have a problem that's well defined, you're halfway <coughs> to a solution. So problem, no negative connotations, only positive. One of their problems is that they are heavily invested in manual annotation for this data set. And they do this continuously and release data once a year. So we applied for a funding for a research project together. Uh, it was granted by the Parkinson's Jubileum Fund. It ran, it's running from, from uh, the start of this year to 2021. And the purpose is to see if we could, one, one part of the project is, uh, could we see, could we make it more or less automatic or semi-automatic for these annotators? Um, and this is the first part of such a study. So it's pretty much work in progress. So takeaways, uh, yes. We could do some of the stuff more or less automatic, but not all. Um, uh, the machine has troubles with this pretty, much pretty much the same things as the human annotators have pr troubles with. Um, the latest coolest methods are actually better than the old and tried tested methods, which is as expected, I, I guess. Uh, and I put something there called data readiness levels. There's something about data and its readiness that is really crucial to all of this. Now you can zone out. <laughs> <laughs> Outline is uh, like this, many, many things. I could talk at length about this. This is, you know, it's a, it's a dear subject. I have 40 minutes, um, so stop me when I'm over you. Um, I will talk about uh, our colleagues in, in Uppsala. I will talk a bit about the path from hypothesis to experiment. I will talk a bit about the uh, categorization experiments and then about the results and, and conclusions. And as you can see in the list of methods that we, we've been using, um, BERT is at two positions there. So uh, yes, let's move on. This is from their website. The Uppsala Conflict Data Program, uh, UCDP, is the world's main provider of data on organized violence and the oldest ongoing data collection project for civil war. Um, it is free data. They, they release this data set for free every year. It's the one that I think UN is, is 
uh, using for measuring uh, what parties are in conflict and so on around the world. There has been other um, attempts at automating this by other actors that has failed so far. Um, a few facts also from the web pages. You can see it's not a cheap endeavor. We have 10 to 15 researchers and staff, programmers and annotators uh, working with this part-time, uh, spending 5 to 10 million uh, crowns a year. Uh, they use Dow Jones Factiva uh, as a news service, um, mostly in English but also in, in other languages. Uh, they scan through 50,000 news items per year manually. Uh, they manu manually code 10 to 12,000 of these. Uh, they are highly trained. What we thought uh, when we started this project is that it should be easy. I mean, just they have the data, just do some machine learning and then, you know. Uh, it turns out that they have internalized much of this data. Um, and they are at the master's level or higher in, in peace and conflict research, uh, often with a specific country as their specialized area. Um, they release data once a year. Um, and the data is freely available. Let's see how what it looks like. This is the first page, userb.uu.se. Um, map of people. Oh, this is uh, this is about areas or regions in conflict. There's not many regions in the world where there hasn't been conflict for the past year, past 40 years or something. This is if you look at the fatalities. Uh, and then you can zoom in and click, and you can see very tiny. Uh, of course, I clicked Stockholm, the five deaths in the terrorist attack a few years ago. So everything like this, they read from different sources, um, and they try to determine different things about the things they read. Like, is this the same event as the other thing I saw? Is this an, um, uh, is this um, more information or contradictory information of an event I've seen already? Um, or do we trust these these uh, sources? Uh, I, I was listening in to one of their weekly meetings where they sit down and and talk about the, the, the problematic cases they have, and they mention, well, in Russia we don't we trust these guys, but not these guys, and so on. So they they were very well uh, knowledgeable about the uh, different actors in the world. Um, this is what they do for each event. So, they try to figure out the time of the event, like starting and ending time dates. Uh, oftentimes, they have an event that has started but not yet ended. They try to figure out uh, things about the geography, and this is the hardest, hardest part of it, I think. <coughs> so, what's the name of the place of the conflict? What's the name of the region, name of country? And these two are the hardest ones, because if you have uh, languages that are transliterated from you know local languages to English, for instance, you have different kinds of spellings for the same things because you're, they are based on on, on the, the way it sounds. Um, they have information about the participants. Um, dyad is one term they use. That's the actually the pair that are are in conflict. They is in conflict, um, and this is the really sad part. The part, the number of deaths in the event. Um, so as you can see, that's quite a lot of information for each s single event. Question? Yes. So when you say that that's the hard part, you mean that it's hard to automatize or it is yes, hard it's for hard them? It's hard for them as well. As well. How yes. is it hard to, is it hard to like agree on names and places because they are really in our language? Yes. So what you have is a taxonomy or ontology. Uh, so if you see one name in Transliterated from Pashto, for instance, that might, might be different spelling from what they have actually in, in their dictionaries, mm -hmm. and they had to know that these places are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so when I when I was sitting next by them, yes, sir. Also, what is an event? Here? You said that there's a starting and end time. Yes, an event is a situation where people die. So that could be like uh, over the period of a second or over ten years, who knows? It could be. Uh, could be like if there's a siege of a hotel somewhere. Right? It starts on Friday Welcome and ends on, on Wednesday. So it, it could be uh, several days or, or longer. Even. 
and also there could be several simultaneous, simultaneous events. So, if for, in, for instance, if two parties are attacking each other and there are civilians that are dying because of this as a side effect, a collateral, that could be a different event. So they have a very strict um, definition of this. Yes. I also have a question about the event. The, um, because uh, you can then aggregate uh, events on top of each other and mm -hmm. call it sort of the war of Sweden or something like yes. that. Do they do that as well or is that s some other... So mm -hmm. these are like very s the tiniest part yes. of... Yes. Okay. Cool. So these are the tiniest part and I think they have definitions. I don't know these definitions by heart, but there's something about uh, less than a certain amount of deaths in a, a conflict area for a, co uh, for a year, a certain period of time, then it's not a war, but it's, it is a war if it's, you know, more than a certain uh, oh, okay. number of deaths. Um, I'm wondering if they uh, get as input, like multiple news articles, for example, that map to the same event? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, <coughs> very often time so. Um, and I will come to this, I think. Uh, so, let's start with a hypothesis. It's always <coughs> nice to have a hypothesis of what we're doing. So I was sitting next to these guys, uh, looking at how, how they work. And let's go back to this for a bit. Um, they are extremely quick in doing this, to just look at the news. They, first of all, they have a, uh, to put it frankly, a, a terrible way of getting the news uh, so they search for news in this feed and they get like a hundred news and they, they scan through it manually and but when they, they find things that are interesting they just look at it and they type start typing like this. So they they are so fast, at least the people I, I watched, uh, they they're so fast so the auto saving method of their uh, speci specialized annotate annotation tool didn't keep up. So well I have to take this field before that one because this takes longer to save. Uh, so, uh, like they're really, really fast. And the things they are, are constantly struggling with turns out to be, uh, as far as I know, the uh, lower or high finer grain geography. Um, Question: yes. what, what do they do when, when news sources give different uh, numbers? So, if they can't resolve it, uh, they have numbers for the deaths. They have uh, a high, low, and a best estimate. Mm -hmm. So they have a bit of span there. But if, they, if there's issues they can't resolve, they, they, they talk about it among themselves. They have meetings for this, like, you know, um, stand-ups, in a way, but weekly. And so you mentioned, for example, disagreements about the spelling in different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, does it make a huge difference in the end? I don't know. That's, that's one thing that I will mention during data readiness levels, that slide. Mm -hmm. Yes? Also in the more languages, they get this news in different languages and they translate them? Uh, yes, some of them know, it's mostly English, uh, some Spanish, some French, some German. Um, some of them know local languages, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I also, uh, Dow Jones, I think, have a service, or is it BBC that has a service that where they read local news and then translate it to, to English. These news sources are quite expensive. Um, that, that's a different talk. Uh, okay, so we started out here by, by thinking that we could pro probably automatize or automate some parts of this, but not everything, given how uh, the human annotators actually struggled with parts of the tasks. So this is our hypothesis going in. So and when we were thinking about event annotated data, I was immediately thinking about uh, applying some sort of information extraction. Information extraction is where you go into the text and actually extract names of dates and, and names of persons and places and put them together in events with relations and stuff. But it turns out that this is not the case. This is not how they annotate the data. They, they just look at the text and then they put labels on it. So it made more sense to actually cast this as a text categorization task than anything else. So for this first, let's call it pilot, this is what we did. Um, and we also, it turned out that we have 17 different tasks for each event. So they have 17 different tasks for each event. And we will see the distribution of the labels for each of these 17 different tasks. Uh, in this particular thing, I did not include the temporal categories, like that is the starting date and ending date, because these, these that's clearly not a good fit for text categorization because go moving forward, these dates will always increase. 
and also that's one of the easiest way to easiest things to solve with uh, ordinary text uh, sorry information extraction uh, also we made one quite big simplification which is that we um, or I um, assumed or took the data that, that had one piece of text uh, for one event usually or quite often there are several events hiding in, uh, in a bunch of text. And I say bunch of text because th these are not clear-cut documents. They, these could be up to maybe seven, ten documents. Uh, and the reason why I made this simpli simplification is because if we can't solve that simple case or simple case, there's no use in trying to do it for the more complicated case where we have multiple events for, for text. Anyone familiar with no Lawrence's work on data redness levels? It turns out to be a very handy conceptual framework to talk to stakeholders. It's very fussy. Uh, stakeholders are often fussy, especially <laughs> if it's business. Uh, but this is a way of talking about the, the readiness of the data. So this is a, like a detour, but it's important. I, I find myself talking about this for every client we have at RISE. What's your readiness? What's the data readiness? It's uh, akin to technological, uh, technology readiness levels, but this is a bit, m bit more coarse. So there's three bands, C being the lowest and A being the highest. There are approximately four, sh four, uh, four levels within, within each band, not, not set in stone. So at the lowest level, we have hearsay data. Someone has heard that there's data. Why do your boss say, oh, we have data, we have a data lake. It's SAP, easy. Uh, <laughs> meaning of band C is accessibility. So we have data. Uh, it's ready to be loaded in some sort of analysis software. Uh, you can start tampering with it. Band B is about the validity. We can do some exploratory analysis. We could see what what the data looks like. We can do some disambiguation of entities and such. Uh, we can start talking about the context, about the hypothesis. We can form around the data. And level A, finally, is about the utility. Data is crisp and clear. We could start doing experiments and model, do models around it. So A1 would be uh, the best kind of data you have. So having said that, the UCDP data, they're, they're the data that they release publicly, the event data, that's clearly band A1. That's top-notch data. They have put lots of effort in this. Uh, and the purpose of this data is to be released freely and for other researchers in their field to work with. However, their internal uh, data set that, that's sort of the, the traces of them doing the annotation it's it's cut and paste from the different news feeds into their database. It's it's uh, a bit of a mess uh, at times. So I would say it's at band B, um, and it, it's clearly also that these data readiness levels has to do with the purpose of the data. So um, for the purpose of producing uh, the annotated data for them. Um, the internal database is probably bound A somewhere. But for us, doing automated learning of it, it's, it's not bound A. And just for me to understand the data readiness levels, do you mean that band B in this case is B, B1? It's, uh, the distinction is not really important. It's just sub A. Sub A. Uh, so, data cleaning again. Um, after the fact, best effort cleaning. Uh, it's never really good to do that uh, if you could do it by design in, in the first place. But uh, again, this is uh, this is an old endeavor. It's it's going on for it's been going on for years, and I don't think they even thought thought about it that they could do, do automated uh, analysis of it when they designed the system. So it's not it's not as strange. This happens all the time. A uh, bit more than thirty one thousand records. One record could be several textual documents. Could be messy HTML and such. Around 12 million tokens. Don't know how many types. We concentrated on the English data. Uh, we had a one-to-one -one mapping between the text and the events. Um, yes. 
I'm going to have a hard time fitting this into 40 minutes. I'll just keep going. Uh, this, uh, these are two examples of short texts. Um, some of them seem structured already. It turns out that they follow different kinds of trackers that are on, online. Um, trackers are where people post, post um, information about um, accidents and or, or, or events like this online. A number of trackers, mm -hmm. and this is a very short news text, I think. So, looking at is it visible? Looking at the distribution of number of tokens per text, it looks like this. The shortest one is three words long, probably much not much information in it. The longest one is 32,000 or 33,000 tokens long, probably too much information. And the average is around 400 words. So that's a you know, good, good chunk of data to work with. Uh, we can also look at the um, sources. You can see anything here. So uh, that's a quite a long tail of sources. The sources being the publishing houses, uh, BBC, BBC again, different kinds of BBCs. Uh, French press and so on. <coughs> and now, looking at the tasks, these are the 17 different tasks that they are trying to, or that they are actually annotating for each event. Um, you see the number of classes ranges from three to four thousand. Um, to make the uh, skewness of the data visible, I just calculated the class entropy. That is how how how, uh, what's, th what's the entropy of, uh, of the distribution of classes? And if you have a low number, it's quite easy to, to uh, uh, well, it's, qu it's quite skewed. The data is quite skewed. And if you have a high number, it's more even. So this is just for reference between the different tasks. And you can see that, for instance, where coordinates has a high entropy. Um, and since you know there's 31,000 something texts and you have 4,000 uh, classes, there's not much data to learn from from each, each of these uh, classes. Uh, on the other hand, you have type of violence. This looks like a really skewed distribution. Three classes for en entropy of 08. And this is the, wor the coordinates uh, where we had 4,125 classes. If you omit the head, then you have a fairly long, uh, quite even distribution. This is, I think this is the first 75 um, classes, labels. I can't even see what, what it is. This is Mogadishu. So where, where did the event take place? Mogadishu, Mosul, Kabul, and so on. So there has been more than a thousand deadly events in the issue. So, really sad numbers. On the other hand, we have uh, the type of violence. I don't even know what type of violence is. It's a, it's a numerical thing. Um, I didn't go that far. Uh, so for me, it's just this low entropy, few classes, unevenly distributed. Should be quite easy to learn. Quite, quite a, a few number of, of uh, examples per per label as well. Okay, uh, we have a very skewed data set for all. There's a single data set actually, but but for all tasks. So we opt to use uh, F1 position recall. Uh, accuracy is never a good thing in these cases. Uh, we do fivefold cross validation uh, because tenfold we're taking too much time. Um, ULM fit, I just used one of the folds actually. I used stratified sampling, this is a must. You can't do anything else if you have this kind of skewed classes. Stratified sampling is someone who cares to explain to see if you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> it makes the data set more balanced. Yeah, so you sample from depending on, on the distribution of the classes. So you have uh, a, a relatively similar distribution in all the folds. So is this for, uh, for evaluation or for training? Both. Okay. Oh, um, naturally, it's for you do it for evaluation. You have this thing. 
you have the same distribution. Uh, sorry, one question. Uh, this is over 40 years documents. Yes. Does the time matter? Because it's not at all here. Yeah. Um, I haven't really looked into it. It should it should matter mm -hmm. um, because of the different places. Mm -hmm. For instance, should be different mm -hmm. over time. Um, but then again. I imagine that the vocabulary and vernacular used for reporting these different kinds of events that, that we're actually trying to use to distinguish between them are, are also uh, time-bound, uh, in a sense. Um, I haven't done any real mm -hmm. proper error analysis. I can always uh, blame that I'm not ready with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we used the same random seed and splits across the different methods and there, in total there were more than 100 experiments that took some, some weeks to compute. Um, so the baseline, the must beat baseline is the random a stratified dummy classifier, this is scikit-learn. Um, pretty much the same as, where, yeah, pretty much the same as the previous speaker. Uh, there you are. But this is sampling based on the different distribution of the gases. This is the must beat baseline. If you don't beat this, <laughs> <laughs> this is a should beat baseline. This is the bag of words uh, with a linear classifier. This is just for testing if there's a signal in there. And what we do use is the bag of word and characters actually. So um, TFIDF weighted characters and <coughs> word vectors. Characters uh, I think is from one to four uh, characters just to get the subword information for out of vocabularies and such. Uh, it turns out that the models are quite big. It takes a lot, lot of time to compute. I don't think it's really feasible to do it, and we are using everything in this data map. So we don't cap the vocabulary otherwise than lo looking at the max DF there. Um, simple logistic regression on this. Uh, and then we looked into ELMO, which was the coolest thing before BERT uh, <laughs> for like five months. Uh, <laughs> and what they did, what, what, sh what was cool is that they had this bidirectional thing. Um, they were learning left and right representations for, um, for, for language, but they concatenated the results instead of, uh, of learning simultaneously as BERT does. So it's a character-based uh, model. We use the pre-trained ELMO, uh, ELMO rep representations are actually the ELMO model at this address. Uh, we are representing the texts in a fixed uh, dimensional vector by, by averaging, averaging all the three L stem layers in the model. Um, and we try this, I try this with a linear classifier as well. Uh, it didn't work as good as I hoped, so I just uh, threw a nonlinear classifier on it and it worked much better. Um, no hyperparameter tuning at all and just use the simple random forest. And the results are quite good. More BERT. Um, we've heard about BERT. The thing with both ELMO and BERT is that they are contextualized. So you can have apple and apple in different senses in, in different uh, different representations. It, it's, this is the opposite for word to vec and fast text and everything where you don't have different uh, embeddings for, for the same word. Um, we use the pre-trained BERT uh, from Hugging Face or not hugging, using via Hugging Face. It's a really convenient way of accessing and fine-tuning models. Uh, they have since renamed it again, I think three times now in the past four months. Um, and since I'm quite lazy, I use it using Spacey, because Spacey is very neat. And they all have also a wrapper for, for the transformers from, from uh, Hugging Face. Uh, and the text for BERT is represent represented by Spacey's way of averaging token representations, which is, I think, different from if you use uh, the CLS token embedding, for instance. Um, you know how they do it? I looked at the code. Uh, I think they do it as they do with the, the usual vector glove representation they're using. That is averaging, uh, averaging the um, token embeddings. But the token embeddings themselves are made up by the word pieces because it's a subword um, representation. So they have a different. They claim to have a weighted scheme of uh, averaging or, or weighting together the different word piece embeddings, also inheriting something from the. Uh, 
end of sentence or CLS tokens. And it seems to work better than the CLS token only. Mm, I didn't try the CLS token, but I think I think it does. It should do. So this was the plain um, BERT, and we also did the same thing, but with a fine-tuned one. I have a question about the ordinary pipeline. What, mm. what do you mean by that? the spacey pipeline? Uh, okay. You should have said it. Uh, are you familiar with spacey? I just tried it out. So you could you could build pipelines and and and, and add components to the pipeline, uh, and then you get it's a nice unified uni unified API for that. So if you have a if you have a document, you can do dot vector and you get the vector representation. That's the what I mean by the ordinary pipeline. Um, fine tuning, uh, and, and uh, contrary to you, I'm not really interested in, in you know inference time and, and model size because it's uh, the freedom of being a researcher right now. <laughs> 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 um, fine tuning took less than a day. Uh, okay. uh, yes. You did it on one GPU. Yes. Didn't you have any out of memory issue? No. I set the uh, batch size quite small. Mm. How much? I don't remember actually. This, um, I don't remember. I can look in my notes. Uh, and how this one. Sorry, yeah. how did you decide uh, when to stop training? Uh, I just put it for 10 epochs. And I, I, I could have done longer without overfitting because uh, I was decreasing in, in loss on both training and validation set. So could have done for longer, but I had to you know, say stop it. Someplace. Um, this is more or less to get a sense of what kind of methods we have to play with uh, and what, what, what works and what not. So going forward, uh, we're actually having a workshop with, with uh, UCDP in a few weeks and then we will decide how to move forward with this. So um, then we'll probably select one of the methods and maybe do more on, on work on that. ULM fit, uh, also a bit of the latest, coolest last year. Universal language model fine tuning for text classification. How many people have taken the fast AI courses? First day. Yes. <laughs> Lesson three, fast AI. Yeah. Hey, this this thing and it it blew everything out of the water, I think. So I decided tr to try it and it worked really, really well. It's it's um it's transfer learning and it's a general method or is it's a method of actually training training a model on a on a large ordinary or balanced, un annotated corpus, uh, and then fine-tune it on your own documents, and then finally do uh, train classifiers. Uh, I use the same uh, model they recommend in the notes. They have lots of clever tricks there for finding the right, right uh, learning rates and so on. Uh, uh, yes. I don't think you can see this, so I'll just be like this. These are the results. Uh, and this is, of course, what we would like to focus on. But the, the, the journey for going from data and idea to actually doing the experiments is quite long. So this will be a short and brief. What we can see here, we have the tasks, we have the number of classes, we have the entropy to show how skewed the data is, we have the, uh, uh, the, the dummy baseline in F score, F1 score. Uh, then there's the bag of words, the Elmo, and there's BERT, BERT fine-tuned, unfit, and then we have a bunch of columns showing the difference between the different uh, methods and the baseline. So we can see that BERT fine-tuned is good for, turns out to be the best in two tasks. ULM fit is good for everything that predicts textual labels, uh, whereas ELMO, un, un, non-fine-tuned, is the best one for predicting numbers. Of course, we could have used regression or, or anything like that there instead. Um, but there is signal in this data set. So even the one with 4,000 classes, we got something that was much better than just uh, guessing. But the problem is, these guys, uh, the ones using scikit-learns linear and nonlinear classifiers, didn't manage to to come through on this one. And this is on a machine with 250 gigabyte ROM. So uh, this problem was too much for them. 
Uh, and as you can see, some of the numbers are quite high. They're in the high 90s, 99.8 and 97.4. Uh, um, so quite good numbers. So we have a substantial improvement uh, with regarding to the must beat baseline. Uh, actually, the should beat baseline, which is the bag of words, is quite competitive. So you should definitely start with that and mix in the characters as well. <laughs> yeah. And there was no hyperparameter tuning for the uh, logistic regression or the random force. Yes. Can I ask a question? Why, why didn't you cast the problem as a, uh, as a problem of retrieving specific words from the text rather than classifying some certain numbers of number of categories? I'm thinking of like the region mm -hmm. or the where coordinates. If this piece of article is telling me about something that happened in uh, uh, Stockholm City mm. is going to mention Stockholm somewhere and if you just pick up the name Stockholm then it's super easy to classify mm. then it's no surprise that the bag of words mm. that sees the, the word Stockholm even just as one mention of Stockholm is going to predict Stockholm with uh, just so 99.4 yeah. F1 score. So but the, the, that's a good idea and, and we thought about that first but it turns out the data is quite messy so if you if you read news text, you have often mentions of background information. Mm -hmm. Could be different uh, and different geographical events. It could be like they start with uh, AFP, uh, Paris, blah blah blah. So we could retrieve uh, we could retrieve all the geog geographical entities uh, more or less accurate accurately from the text using Max Basic, uh, even though it's not that good. Um, and we could probably use that as features, but what we wanted to see is could we actually do it more or less the same way as I think the annotators, the human annotators are doing it, they just look at the text and see. You're waving, what's happening? Yeah, the camera's overheating, so... <laughs> so, can I ask a uh, question yes. in regards to that? So each, each task here was separately trained yes. on each model, yes. right? Cool. Yeah. yeah, also with respect to this question, why did you separate the training of region, country, city, etc.? Why, why were these different models where, they're, where instead they're clearly correlated mm. in the data? Mm. It, it has to do with the way they fill out the form when they annotate the data. So they have uh, different fields for different kinds of regions. Uh, and what I'm thinking is that we could probably use this for some of the, the fields that they fill out, we could pre-populate using some of these models, mm -hmm. but not all of them. So that's why I separated them. Also trying mm -hmm. to get it, get it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. Because if I, if I would conflate different, uh, having, uh, are you meaning like we should have like a multi-label output from? I would just suggest that your model should output the region, the country, and the city at the same time, the same model. Mm -hmm. Because probably if your model is very good at predicting the city, yeah then it's going to be very good at predicting the region as well. Mm. So you don't need two different models for that. That's true. That's a good point. Maybe that's for something to do next. Um, yes? I was wondering, uh, was there any hierarchical classification? For example, regions could be very close to the country and vice versa. So I think hierarchical classification in this regard could provide yes. better results. I think that's pretty much the same thing. Mm. Uh, Yes, no, we did not so far, so I had a question here. Yes, uh, here you, you, you will conclude maybe that uh, Ulm is better than the others uh, based on this result. But here, for instance, 82 and 82.5 from mm. B. Uh, do you think it's significant? No. I mean, did you try to make a measure of significance? No, not at all. And also, Ulmfeld is just using one of the folds because I didn't have the time to retrain the classifiers, all, all 17 the classifiers on, on five different folds, so it's not, sig not significant at all, actually. I have another question. Yes. Uh, regarding the stratified sampling, yes. did you use any particular threshold to eliminate the lower class uh, instances? No. They have, they have to be, yes, uh, there is a, a threshold of two, I think. 
there has to be both in, in, in both uh, in the fold, held out fold and in the training data. Do you consider any experiments where you increase or decrease this threshold to see the overall performance changing? No, not yet. So I, from what I've seen is that the machinery we have struggles with pretty much the same things that the human annotators are struggling with. So we can not solve, I think, what they need to have solved. But what we can do is actually to make something, make them have more time to think of these instances mm -hmm. instead of the ones that we can actually. Mm -hmm. So it's again, it's back to the business value. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I have an idea on how accurate uh, humans are. No, that's one of the, the problems. I should have mentioned that. No, actually, there's no inter annotator agreement for this um, because they didn't think of it. So they are, as we all are, quite thinly spread on their tasks. So they are, you know, the highly skilled annotators and they're working with their respective. Um, uh, parts of the, of the data set and, and different regions in the world and sometimes they convene and talk about the different ca uh, hard cases but not more than that there's no internet data agreement at all as far as I know and by the way PyTable Writer is an invaluable tool for generating LaTeX tables like this <laughs> automatically <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so we had improvements. There's a high variance uh, from, from the worst to best for the different tasks. Um, ULM fit and fine tune bird works best for categories, give or take. Elmo best for numbers. Uh, the cheap baseline, the should be baseline is not really scaling well. Uh, conclusions. There are different baselines to consider and all you need to Keep track of what, why you're doing this. It's so easy to get stuck in this, you know, fiddling with hyperparameters and doing this and doing that. But is this really contributing anything? Uh, we don't have a real client in the sense that that, that uh, you guys might have, but we have uh, other researchers wanting to do this better and, and release they, their data more often and so on. I, I'm not a UX guy, but I would argue that some of the things that we have produced here could actually be useful, even though the, the performance is not in the high 90s. Uh, using controlling for the, uh, uh, for the, um, oh, I lost the word. How good the predi predictions are, for instance, and how you interact with the data or with the, the classifications. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go too low, you should just probably leave it alone. And if we, look at the confidence with, with, uh, with which the classifiers produce, you know, the, the ones that do not do that well, maybe if we just ignore those, maybe we should, we would have a, um, a higher score, which would be satisfying, but not really true. Um, again, this is a simplified setting. I don't know what happens if we do it, or when we do it for multiple events in, in a single text. And this is, I will use this data. Unfortunately, I can't distri distribute this, da this data, but it's a really good task, sorry, a set of tasks across uh, one and the same data set. Um, I think that's it, 42 minutes. <laughs> Yes. I have a question. How much time have you spent on this? Because this is still, I mean, since, since you're comparing with the baselines and mm. so on, this is quite an extensive analysis. Mm. How long time does it take from like pre processing everything? And is it, are you the only one? Yes. Or okay. For this, I'm the only one. We have we have two more people in, in the project. And, um, they're working with, with proper event destruction uh, and, and so. Um, I started this work in June. And it was summer, uh, maybe six weeks. So. Uh, but I opted to have some more tools in my toolbox, so I uh, read up on stuff you, know, that you can do if you have the opportunity to work with things like this. Eight weeks, maybe. Yes? Yes, so the fact that both the machine and people tend to get the very fine grain plays wrong Shouldn't that be an argument that that sort of label is not that good? Like people around there have your reference. Mm. Shouldn't that just like be a better thing to actually store and mm. actually try to predict? Mm. I don't know if you think yes. about this. 
I think, yes, I think you're right. We shouldn't even try to do this in this way because we could say we want more data. Uh, and really, we don't want more data because that means people have died. Uh, we would like to maybe do it differently than classification because they are using uh, an ontology. So maybe we could use that information and do better matching in some way. I'm not sure. But that's true. Yeah, uh, I just wonder, this is based on text only. Yes. Have you considered feature engineering? Because you can probably extract features from the past. Yes, I, I, I'm <coughs> uh, in particular thinking of doing it with ULM fit because you can have, um, there are methods for incorporating, incorporating metadata in that. So you could mm -hmm. use, for instance, the source, um, um, the source of the uh, news publisher, you can use the dates and so on in there. So I, I, I've thought about it, I haven't done it. What did you say that the other people working uh, on the project were working with? Uh, at our, our yeah. place, uh, they're working with, with um, let's say, uh, yes, event detection, like information extraction type event detection. So going into the text, looking at the different um, uh, phrasings of events taking place and what entities are partaking in those events and so on see how far we could get there. So maybe okay. there is a complementary uh, approach to use apart from text classification. But but you're not using the same they're not using the same label data set at all. Same label data set. Okay. Yes. It's a but um, I think a bit cleaner because they uh, spent two more weeks cleaning it, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'm curious about the, the time aspect as well. Um. Because I'm thinking like I mean as time moves on the more classes you're going to yes. you're going to get and you're also going to be less sure when yes. you know when there's a new war and so on. How do you take that into account? I and don't. No, I, don't. I, I understand. I'm just thinking uh, like how, how can you how can you think about and this is more like well yes because that, yeah. that's that's the reason I, I omitted the temporal aspect because yeah. it's it's clearly increasing mm -hmm. uh, exactly. the number of labels. But the other mm -hmm. ones are not increasing that much. If you look at the number of deaths and so on, that's quite bounded. Mm -hmm. If you look at the geography and so on, it's also quite bounded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, it is increasing. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in us, or changing because some some uh, some aspects are some 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 places ha have peace and uh, some others has conflict over time. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's that's what I'm thinking because I mean I think that the most recent recent events mm. are probably harder to yes. to classify, mm. and those are the ones that you actually want to classify. And yeah. another thing is when you have overload. I think this is Rwanda. Mm -hmm. uh, Western media did not publish on every single event. And then you have to go into, and then that's one of their challenges at UCDP, you have to go into more or less local sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's a, that's why they have a best estimate of that. Yes? Um, so if I understood you correctly, the, the annotators... So they, they uh, as I mentioned, they are quite um, skilled at just looking at the text and fill some, some of the fields. It turns out that that's the same field that the machine can do because they're getting used to it. Uh, so I don't think we could measure it that way, or we should measure it that way, because that's not how they work, really. Um, I just be guessing that the, 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 the most value you can generate is when a person never has to look at one of the news articles, either because you conclude that this is not relevant or you uh, correctly conclude that yes. all so the relevant things. So that, well, that's a different thing then, because one of their problems is um, okay, the, your first question was about if we had access to the uh, non-relevant. Uh, no, so no, it's just sort of uh, voice, like you have a stream of things after those to determine whether or not one is relevant or an event. Yes. So um, we would like to have, a, have, a, have, have access to the thing that they discarded, but they don't save it. Okay, yeah. uh, which is one of the things, going forward, if, if they or we decide to implement parts of this, they have to rethink how they are doing with their data and data readiness again. Um, um, I lost it. Yes. Sorry. Mm, I'm just curious. Uh, the Norwegian accident is not here. Is that classified as non terrorism? Um, 
I wonder if it has to do with it was one single guy and not an organization. Mm. I'm not sure. It's mm. it's um, it's uh, in their guidelines. So there's not every dead person. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just where there are different sites. Cool. Any more questions? I have, a, I have a question. Are you not planning to uh, in improve their u user experience when they're doing the annotation? Is that the future step? Uh, maybe. Um, maybe. Uh, we will talk about this with them. Um, but as a researcher, I would like someone else to do it. Thank you very much, Rudy. I think uh, that's